Hey everybody, welcome to our November meeting of the Fort Wayne Astronomical Society. We have a guest tonight, Tom Field, and I think we'll get right to the guest. So I'll turn it over to Sarah. So she's the program and vice president, so I'll let her introduce Tom. Hi everyone, it's good to see Hello, you guys. Hi Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Today we have Tom Field and he's a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope magazine for the past seven years and he also is the author of the RSpec software, which is what, oh, I lost our window, okay, which is what we've been using um, at our observatory and he's going to teach us a thing or two about spectroscopy. So I'll let you take it away, Tom. Thanks, Sarah. I didn't recognize your name that you are users of uh, the software. Cool. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks, thanks for inviting me, and uh, thanks to Sarah and others for uh, all the work that goes on in the background to make meetings happen uh, and get guests, uh, speakers, and all that stuff. I'm going to speak for 45, 50 minutes or so, and uh, then we can do a Q&A session afterwards, just open up uh, people's mics if people have questions. I'll tell you a little bit more about my background as I get into the presentation. The screen will jump in. There we go. So how have we uh, managed to discover so much about the universe when really we haven't even left home? You know, we're still in such a localized region. Images for, you know, more than a century have given us two-dimensional views. And with uh, eclipses, we can get a sense of depth. And then uh, with uh, uh, a little bit of time involved, we can see things changing. Maybe you can see some of those stars changing there. Let me just uh, rearrange my screen a little bit here. Give me just a moment just to get things the way I like them. There we go, good. And um, if you spread out the colors, you get an as if fifth dimension. I love this, just the aesthetics of it. The colors are beautiful. I, I sometimes like, if I can get there, like figuring out where does blue end and green begin? You know, it's such a gradual transition. But these gaps in that rainbow reveal something about our star as well as other stars and, and planets that we study. Things like what their comp uh, composition is. I'm not gonna read those bullets there, you can see. I'm gonna show you examples tonight of, uh, of these kinds of things that we can do. Now even, and I asked earlier before some of you arrived, how many of you were imagers? Even if you're not an active imager, I think you'll find tonight interesting because it gives you some insight into something that is really literally the primary tool for astronomical research. 60, 70, 80% of the research that gets done, whether it's detecting exoplanets uh, or, you know, studying uh, black holes, gets done spectroscopically. I don't know how I would prove that number percentage, but it's a large number regardless. So understanding a little bit more about it uh, will help your appreciation as, as well as a future understanding of articles that you read. A little bit of the science just to get everybody to the same level. Of course, Sir Isaac Newton discovered you could split light, white light into its component colors using a prism. And you can also bounce the light off a finely lined surface like that DVD, or you can uh, uh, just put it through a piece of glass that has fine lines, called a diffraction grating. Bunsen invented his uh, Bunsen burner to burn samples, to put the light through a prism, and then look at the result. Now, one cool thing is he deliberately, explicitly didn't patent it. He said, I want this discovery to be for the good of humanity in, in going forward, which is of course, today there'd be a handful of patents on every screw and bolt on the Bunsen burner. The cool thing was, he was a pyromaniac. He burnt everything and he kept good records of what he saw. And you'll see how those catalogs really served us going forward uh, in a few minutes. Kirchhoff here, let me tell a uh, uh, PowerPoint here to not hide my cursor. Microsoft doesn't make that a sticky setting, which means I have to do it every time I go into PowerPoint shows. Thanks, Microsoft. So Kirchhoff was a colleague of Bunsen's. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about him except one particular point on this slide here. And that is you'll notice that uh, we have a spectrum there that's got, it's got a rainbow Roy G. Biv background with some gaps, as opposed to this spectrum, which is more or less a black background with some lines. Now, which you get, uh, regardless of which one you get, the lines are in the same position. So it really doesn't matter. We're going to see examples of both of these tonight. Which one you get depends on things we won't talk about that Kirchhoff did, like the temperature of the gases that 
uh, are going, you know, and, and the cloud that they're going through and so forth. But um, both of these spectra are uh, often used. So, and you can see these lines, which we'll talk about in a moment, how they come to be, are unique between elements. So this helium, like the helium you might fill a balloon with at a florist, it's very different than the hydrogen. There's, this hydrogen line just doesn't exist in helium. In fact, there's so much hydrogen, it's so useful. It's useful to, to have this term to describe the hydrogen lines. And we've even given names to those lines, like we give Greek letters to the stars in intensity order in the constellations. So for example, this hydrogen alpha, of course, is in red, and this beta is in, that's robin egg blue, shall we say. So here's a periodic table of spectra. This is something I created a few years ago. We sell mostly to schools, educators, although uh, some of the really uh, excited spectroscopy amateurs uh, end, up, end up buying it also. You can see there's that hydrogen alpha in red and that robin egg blue hydrogen beta and so forth getting characteristically closer together as we go further to the left. But that's a very different spectrum than the one that we'd see in this helium. Uh, that's the idea of fingerprints. So we don't have to burn things anymore. Um, thank goodness, we actually have uh, devices that will, ah, uh, oh, darn, I shut it down, I think. Yep, um, we have devices that will uh, burn a gas tube for us. I'm gonna stop my video for a second. I wanted to uh, try something new tonight, uh, and that is to show you, um, now is the screen still being shared? No. So let's share the screen again. Sorry for the brief, there we go. What I wanted to show you isn't this, so I, I won't show it to you, but basically back here, uh, if I turn my camera back on, little stumble there. So back here is a gas tube device and there is, you know, these tubes that are like neon tubes, except in this case, this one has helium in it, you can see, or hydrogen. And when you turn it on, you can see the spectrum, uh, well, the gas tube. And then if you put a device on it, you can see the rainbow. That was about the worst slide I've ever presented. So let's just keep moving here. Um, and I'll show you that little demo maybe later, later if we have time. So there's a hydrogen alpha that you see on the gas tube and there's that beta in, in the robin egg blue. We actually, and that's what, this is what I was gonna show you. Uh, I created this camera a few years ago for chemistry, astronomy and uh, physics teachers. And uh, it, it basically lets you see the spectra real time. It's sort of fun to see it live. So far, everybody I've mentioned are old white men. Let's look at some of the non-old, non-white, non-men. First, Annie Jump Cannon and her team of, uh, and they were called the computers. The interesting use of the term, of course, has changed since then. More than 100 years ago, they were denied access to the Harvard uh, telescopes because they were women. So instead of hands-on observing, they uh, ended up examining the photographic plates of spectra. They were really good at it. They were fast at it. They cataloged hundreds of thousands of spectra. And through their insight and, and hard work and understanding came up with a classification scheme that actually worked, unlike all the previous ones. Uh, we really owe them a great debt. Priyavada Nataraja, she's at Yale. She studies uh, gravitational lensing on uh, massive black holes. Nancy Grace Roman, you can see in the background, uh, there's the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope model. She was the first uh, astronomer at NASA and uh, got her PhD in the late 1940s a real proponent of the Hubble Space Telescope and helped make it happen. Uh, Elisa Quintana studies uh, uh, exoplanets around uh, red giants mostly. She's active on Twitter and uh, I selected this slide. It was a really, this is a fun screen to put together this summer because uh, I was just finding so many women who were doing cool things out there who I'd never heard of. And you know, she was one I came across and, so, and I read about her a little bit on uh, I think Wikipedia, threw her in. And now I'm coming across her on, on uh, Twitter. I'm going, hey, I talk about you in my talks. I haven't told her that yet. I'm not sure she really wants to hear that from anybody. But uh, uh, basically exoplanets around uh, uh, red giants is what she studies. And finally, Jedediah Eisler, uh, she's at Dartmouth and she studies uh, hyperactive black holes. I don't know the difference between massive and hyperactive. Uh, so uh, we have a long, uh, we've, we've come a long way before we move on. We've come a long way, uh, but we have a long ways to go in terms of uh, equality in the field. The astronomy field is, is making some good strides. The AAS, our, our official uh, body here in the U.S. over the last several years has really gotten very active in uh, in promoting equality and, uh, and other issues that are important in these areas. 
I want to talk tonight about this uh, slide that you saw a preview of, of a moment ago. This is just a little uh, grating that you screw onto your telescope. I used to have a slide right here that had 10 bullet points of the things that I wanted to say. Uh, and I, I created that slide earlier this year. Things that, uh, points I wanted to make, I figured why not just lay them out? But you know, nobody wants to read a slide with 10 bullet points. So I've got another solution. It's the first time I'm doing it this way. Uh, when there's a bullet point or a key point, I'm just gonna ring this little bell here. And then after my talk, you can tell me whether you found it obnoxious or whether you think it was helpful. And this is one of those moments. And the idea is in this case, there's a myth that, oh, to do spectroscopy, it's gonna be expensive. Uh -uh. That's why this is a ding moment. Because for like 200 bucks, you get a grading and you're good to go. So there's lots of ways to mount the gratings. Uh, here you can see on a DSLR, uh, there's this little adapter here that we sell for the lens cap threads, or you can put it on, uh, on a Fitz camera, cooled or not, or you can put it on a, um, you know, this is a video camera, it happens to be a color, could be color, could be mono, doesn't matter, or even in a, in a um, filter wheel. So there's lots of ways to mount this. So I suppose that's a ding moment too, because I think the myth is, oh, you know, this kind of science with an amateur telescope, you've got to be a do-it-yourselfer and build all this equipment and, no. So you can even piggyback your DSLR on a telescope if you want to multitask and, and do two things at once. All right, history, theory, and equipment are behind us. Let's see what we can actually do. Check out this. So starlight goes through the grating, creates a spectrum which we capture on our sensor. This is our first wonderful example. These are all different spectra captured at a different time by Torsten Hansen with just an eight inch Newtonian and a, a video camera, right? Just pretty much like this ZWO. And again, the myth is, and so this is a ding moment. The myth is, I don't know if that's gonna work. The myth is that, uh, that it takes a lot of expensive equipment and long exposures to get spectra. And of course, that's not the case as I'm showing here. These are videos. So we're talking, you know, sub, sub second frames. So they are in temperature order, starting at uh, the hot stars, uh, B stars, and going down here to the type M stars. Um, I don't really like the acronym, will be a fine guy or girl, kiss me, uh, especially in the Me Too era. So I was looking around online and I found this, this one here, um, which uh, isn't as catchy. Might apply to most of us though. Okay, boomer, a fully green kilowatt matters. All right, <laughs> like I said, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really have a catchy ring to it. But you know, one of those bullets I showed in an early slide talked about knowing star temperatures from spectrum. Look at the differences as we go through the temperatures here. I'm gonna show you two quick differences. First, that, well, that's not even a line or a series of lines, that's like a forest, right? It's called a band. And it's only on these cool type M stars. The hotter stars don't have that band. So what's the deal? Well, these cooler stars are relatively cooler than the hotter stars. And so in their outer shell, there can be some more complex molecules that just don't get incinerated by the star. In this case, it's a, a titanium oxide. But again, I don't know anything else more about titanium oxide, but maybe I could spell it. And then and you see it on, uh, on cooler stars. The deal is, and this is a ding moment too, I think a lot of us think that we, uh, we need to be uh, PhDs in astrophysics to do this kind of thing. And, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. If a knuckle dragging programmer like I can understand this. The cool thing is with this is you read up on things that interest you and you don't on things that don't interest you. There's no quizzes or, or anything. And, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. The other thing I wanted to show you was this band right here. That's in what the robin egg blue, that line, you can see it's much more prominent there on that type A star with like Vega. So why isn't it as prominent on these hotter stars? And why isn't it as prominent on these cooler stars? Well, just a tiny bit more of science and that is the Bohr model of the atom has these orbits that electrons go around in and sometimes jump between. They can jump up and down. When they jump, they absorb or emit energy. So, but on these hotter stars, these electrons as they're, as they're pumped up by the heat don't even stop at level four. They keep going to five and beyond. So there aren't as many electrons on level four to make this transition. And on these cooler stars, a lot of the electrons 
just aren't even pumped up to level four. They just make it to level three or not even that high. So again, it's this transition from four to two that makes this hydrogen beta line that's uh, so common. We'll be seeing lots of examples of that. So you see those crosshairs there. You know, if I, suppose I got time on the Hubble Space Telescope, did some research and then submitted a paper for publication. And I said, we saw a little bit of dimming in right in the robin egg blue region. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be published, right? So we need quantitative data. To do that, we create a very simple graph. So this graph here, this axis is intensity. So the star is very bright. Because see, some of the starlight doesn't get bent into the rainbow. Some of it just goes straight through. The star is very bright and narrow. So this peak is very high, but not very wide. Whereas this thing, it's, it's pretty dim out here on the edges and pretty bright in this thick area in the middle. So it's dim, 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 brighter, 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 dim, 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 dim. And the cool thing is now we can quantitatively see that absorption feature in the robin egg blue, the hydrogen beta. Now we're doing science. Now we can measure where it is on the x-axis, its color and angstroms. Now we can measure its depth. Is it there tomorrow? Is it there on other stars, other planets, other instruments? All sorts of cool science. Now, how do we get that graph? So my story is I wanted to do, I, I got into, all, into, into astronomy in 1990 or so. And uh, I wanted to do in uh, like 2009 some science and I got a hold of a grading and I put it on my C8. It was fun to hear about the older C8s that some of you have. And um, I'm about three miles from downtown Seattle from Pike Place Market. So I went outside, it's, you know, right outside here in my backyard one Saturday night in August. I captured a video with a webcam and it's actually somewhere here in my office. I, I had it out the other day and uh, I don't see it at hand here. But, you know, I duct taped it on to uh, the barrel of a eyepiece and uh, I captured a video. This is a frame from that video, that first night out. And I, again, ding moment. You don't have to be an expert imager to do this. I was a terrible imager. And uh, the nice thing about video, uh, if you're using video, is that you get real-time feedback. So, and that's the R in my software's name. R spec stands for real-time spectrum. So I came in at midnight, my neck was sore. My blue jeans had grass stains on the knees because you know, it's Vega in August, what do you expect? Sunday morning, I tried to create this graph and I couldn't. I downloaded uh, two or three of the shareware programs that were out there. One wouldn't install, <laughs> the other one kept crashing. It was half, half the error messages and, and all the screens were, were in French. There was no manual and, the, and the, all these programs just weren't up to the level of usability that we've all become accustomed to. So what did I do? I gave up. Why? Because I was so frustrated. You know, life's too short to be frustrated, especially when it's a hobby. And that's what I told my wife. I said, I'm supposed to be having fun. <laughs> this isn't fun. So I put the grading in the drawer. But over the next couple of weeks, in my idle moments, I still kept thinking about it. And I decided, OK, next Saturday, I'm going to write a program just to create this graph. And this is the graph I created. Sunday morning, I was done. And now, 10 or 15,000 hours and 10 years later, the software's almost done. So. God, we get a lot of spam calls. So the software is all, almost done. And my wife says, would you please finish the software so that we can have dinner at a regular hour? And actually it is done. We eat regularly now. But, but um, I hadn't intended to create a product, but uh, people saw it and they liked, liked what it did. So that's what it became. So, you know, the, again, ding moment here. I think one of the things that people think when they get into a new aspect of astronomy and Im imaging is... I'm going to have to learn a new program. What a pain in the neck. New software, new learning curve, falling flat on my face. And that's, that is a real concern. We all have gone down that path or tried to climb that learning curve, right? So I know better than to do a software demo for you all. It's after dinner, you know, five minutes into the demo on all of you who have video showing, we're just going to start seeing the tops of your heads because you're going to have nodded off. And thank God you're muted so that so that we don't hear you snoring. So, but I do, in spite of that, want to spend a moment showing you the software. So you see how easy it is. So this is an image, this happens to be a, a stopped frame from that first video I made. It could be a Fitz image that got loaded automatically. You continue to use whatever imaging software you're using and then just have that, that automatically loaded in here. So you just bracket in the region that you want to study 
and you get that intensity graph. So this peak here, of course, is the star. And this area here is this. Uh, for example, that gap right there is that dip right there. So, and that's oxygen, or uh, yeah, that's oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's all very well and good. It sure is easy to get that graph, but now what? Um, yeah. you, you get the numbers on the bottom. Pardon me? What was that, Evans? I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't hear you. How do you get the numbers on the bottom? That's a really good question. Uh, let me save that for the Q&A because I don't want to uh, get too much into the software right now. That's an excellent question. It's a couple of clicks. Uh, and once you've done it once, you never have to do it again. Uh, but thank you for asking that. That's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, so these dips, the way that you uh, interpret these is, remember I mentioned that Bunsen created a catalog. Well, the great, 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 great grand catalog of that catalog is, is still being used today and is built into the software. So you can come up here and say, I'm going to add a check mark here and see it put these lines up here. Those are reference lines. Right? They're saying, if you see a dip right where this line is on the left, that's because there's hydrogen alpha uh, transitions occurring or hydrogen beta. That means we've now, look, there's a dip for all these lines. That's fairly conclusively showing that as the starlight was leaving Vega that night 11 years ago with my C8 in the backyard and a video camera in the city, that light had some of its energy removed by electrons jumping up and down. And we were able to detect it here. This is a mind-blowing screen the first time you see it, as those of you who have captured this kind of data can confirm. So uh, the other thing to show you, I mean, the color fill is cool, but this is actually a stop on a video, a, a freeze frame that was playing at two frames per second. Let's play it. So here you can see the star and the spectrum are moving around a little bit because of seeing, and also, of course, our data is jumping around. This is a really great screen for outreach. And that's a ding moment, too, because if you're doing outreach, uh, this kind of color and movement, people get really interested. Or if you want to, for example, go into a school when things get back to normal later next year, we hope. Being able to go to a chemistry, physics, or astronomy professor and, or teacher and say, you know, I've got some science to show you here. You don't have to know a lot of the science. You don't have to be a, a physicist, thank goodness. Well, so this is the science that you can springboard into other discussions about the science. Uh, or if you want to mentor students, you know, you get to choose the cream of the crop, typically, uh, the ones who are capable and interested. They're the ones who are going to be interested in doing this and, um, and teach them some spectroscopy. It, it wins science fairs frequently. So uh, the, a quick other thing to show you, and that is, let me turn off this fill for a second. There is, there's the hydrogen alpha feature coming and going because our seeing is changing. We're all familiar with stacking. I'm gonna turn on stacking here and watch how quickly at two frames per second, that feature stabilizes, becomes rounded, symmetrical. Isn't that cool? So that's the power of stacking. Uh, so let's leave this screen now. The only other thing I'd ask you is in your mind's eye, you could, just remember this screen, uh, mainly that there are these hydrogen bomber reference lines showing us where in the lab we've observed hydrogen and we'd expect to see it on a star. Because I'll show you some, uh, some scientific research that uses that kind of data shortly. Here's a star party, like I mentioned earlier, you can see you wouldn't do this at a dark sky site with all that light, but they're looking at a gas tube here and then they transitioned into looking at stars. This is actually done in France. Um, Here's a wide field view with a couple of stars and a couple spectra. There's an absorption feature. Uh, here's a star here with some <laughs> lumps in the spectrum. Those are emission lines. Again, uh, when the electrons are, uh, are dropping, you get an emission line. When they're going up between shells, you get an absorption line. So, and the reason these are so wide is because we've saturated our pixels, so we're getting some blooming. So let's look at a Wolfrey A star for a second. Now I have a confession to make, and that is when Janet Simpson sent me this, I couldn't remember what a Wolfrey A star was. And maybe you can't either. I mean, you like I, maybe you've uh, um, read, you like I have, yeah, you like I, I suppose works, um, have uh, probably read about Wolfrey A stars in your astronomy career a handful of times at least. But you know, things do go in one ear and out the other. So Wikipedia is your friend. And, you know, Wikipedia tells us that Wolfrey A stars are late stage, very massive stars. They're shedding their outer shell. 
uh, huge stellar winds, uh, which are broadening the features spectroscopically. That's what the spectrum looks like. And if you'll notice, we've got carbon, carbon, carbon. Why would we have carbon on a star? Well, you remember that stars burn through the elements progressively. And part of that burning process includes carbon. And we're actually seeing it on the star here with a 30 second DSLR image. It's pretty amazing. So here's another object that's going to have emission lines, our beloved uh, showpiece ring nebula. And you can see it just has two different colors there, one for hydrogen alpha and one, this, uh, this Roman numeral three means ionized. It just means some electrons are pulled up. So ionized oxygen. Most extended objects are pretty boring with a grating like this. This is practically the only one that looks interesting. Usually they're just smeared because there's a lot more data than just two points. So, but I wanna show you what a high resolution device looks like. First of all, they're an order of magnitude more expensive. It's not often you get to use that expression when talking about equipment, I suppose so. You know, some cheap camera tripod versus a paramount perhaps. That's probably more than an order of magnitude, several orders, they're expensive. And they're also harder to use because now you're looking through a 20 or 30 micron slit. You have to acquire and track your target exactly on that slit or you don't get any data. So almost nobody starts with slit spectrometers, like one in a hundred does it. And, you know, it's just, it's too steep a learning curve technically as well as just even uh, what's going on spectroscopically. Uh, but here is M42 with a slit spectrometer. It's an extended object, but because it's a slit spectrometer, we have nice narrow peaks. And you can see there's hydrogen alpha and there's that Roman numeral three on the oxygen, ionized oxygen. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a second, just to ask if anybody's interested in sharing, I won't call on anybody, to share with us the first time you saw M42 and what it looked like. What was the telescope like? What was your impression? Anybody wanna share? Bueller, anyone? Okay, last chance. Okay, well, we'll go back to sharing my screen here. I mean, you get stuck with my quick story. And that was, it was, uh, it was the early 1990s. I, I wanted to get a telescope because I had read about Shoemaker-Levy 9. And I went out to the Denver Astronomical Society's Urban Star Party, first quarter star party. It's fun when you can remember before you knew something, how you interpreted what you saw. I, st I got out of the car and walked behind the uh, Chamberlain Observatory there that has their 42 inch, I think, Clark refractor. And when I looked across the observing field of amateur setup, what I saw, you know those, those cannons that sh they shoot people out of in the circus? That's what I thought I was seeing. I mean, I had no reference, they were daubs, of course, but how would I know? I had never seen a daub before. So I queued up and there was somebody running the daub, much like some of you or me. And I was all excited, you know, they were excited. I got up to the eyepiece, it was M42. And I looked through it and it was a smudge. That's what I was fishing for when I asked some of you to share. It was a smudge. It was just this black and white nothing. I was, I, honestly, I was disappointed. I'd seen photographs before. So I knew what to expect, but that's not what I saw. But I'll tell you, and, and this is in your experience too. Even though it was disappointing, I still go back and look today at M42. Why would I do that? Well, I think there's a handful of reasons. The first is better equipment, darker sights, but also we're much better averted vision now, right? Now we can look at things through the more sensitive parts of our eyes and uh, you know, really see more detail. <laughs> but <laughs> in truth, jesting aside, I think the reason we go back and look at things that originally were uninteresting was because now we understand more about what we're looking at. And when we bring that understanding to the eyepiece, that really deepens our experience. So that's definitely a ding moment because spectroscopy has done that for me. It has really opened up areas of understanding, not very deep, but understanding so that I appreciate it a little more about why hydrogen alpha and why oxygen and so forth. So here at the top, we can see the spectra with big gaps of uh, Uranus and Neptune. There's the graph and there's the band of lines, right? It's like a forest, like I mentioned earlier. What do we know about forests? We know they're from cool objects where more complex molecules can survive. Well, these are certainly cooler than a star. And what would it be as a more complex molecule? Well, 
how about the methane on these planets? We're actually with a backyard telescope, same guy. So this is again, webcam or, or a, yeah, it was a, a imaging source camera and an eight inch refractor, Newtonian. We're able to see the methane on these planets. So in 1881, Henry Draper, that's the Draper catalog guy, observed a comet, the New York Times thought it was significant enough to actually publish it. So here's a comet in the lower left, you can see there's the spectrum, nice string of gems. And over here on the right, you can see there are the colors, uh, again, the swan bands, mostly carbon. This was captured by a guy in India, Vikrant Agnihotri. He's a nuclear power plant engineer in Rajasthan in Northwest India. India. And when he captured this in 2013, he was a brand new, you know, he was a rank beginner. Now he's an expert and I learned from him. And you know, what teacher doesn't like to learn from their student? I do a lot of mentoring and teaching as part of my job here. Uh, I love doing it. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. Uh, but it's fun for me to coach people and, and how to get started and, and you know, give them feedback on their images and help them understand what they're doing. So um, I want to show you a more uh, contemporary example. Here's Neil Wise, and that's the sodium of the tail. Now, the cool thing is this was captured, this word objective grading refers to, um, I pointed this out earlier, we have this little adapter that threads onto the nose piece threads uh, of a, a lens cap threads of a DSLR, and then you can just thread the grading into it. And there are occasions, even though it's small aperture, there are occasions when this can be a very high resolution compared to a telescope for some technical reasons. So I love this slide. So this guy, he used a C-clamp to attach a, a video camera to his tracking mount. You know, if it was me, I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I'm not a do-it-yourselfer. I break just about everything I touch. In fact, you know, in Windows, my favorite keystroke is Control Z or Edit Undo. So if it was me, I would have cranked that C-clamp so tight, I would have, you know, collapsed that enclosure. But fortunately, Robin Leadbeater didn't. He attached a star analyzer to a video camera, and he designed the star analyzer. Here's a single frame uh, during the course of that one frame, which was probably a quarter second or so. The meteor moved that distance. And then this thing over here is the actual spectrum. So that gap is that dip in the spectrum. And you can see that Robin was able to identify all these peaks. And this is a weird sub-branch of amateur astronomical spectroscopy. I mean, you've got to wait for a bright uh, meteor shower and you've got to, you know, there's a lot of waiting involved. You don't get second chances usually. So um, I don't want to talk much about the sun. We've heard a lot about it in the last couple of years and we're going to again in the next few years, except to point out that this yellow line was discovered, as you can see here, in 1868 during a total eclipse. Normally the sun's an extended object, so without a slit you can't really do much spectroscopy. But during an eclipse, it's just a narrow object. These guys didn't know what this was. They didn't find anything that Bunsen had burnt that was yellow. So they said, well, we don't know what this is. Let's just give it a name. There's something on the sun that glows yellow at about 5,800 when it's excited. Greek name for uh, sun is Helios, we'll call it helium. Now you fast forward 50 years or so, two different researchers were burning some gases they had created in the lab to see what they were made of. And they saw that yellow line, they were able to go, Eureka, that stuff that we discovered 40 years ago, 93 million miles away and knew a physical property of close yellow and named helium, we've now discovered here on earth. I love this example because it really shows how science works. It's a great example for some of your friends who may not be as uh, big a believers in science, shall we say. So if you uh, image novae, some have iron absorption, some don't, even with a DSLR. Quick review of Doppler shift. An example of Doppler shift is the pitch change, and some, most of you know this, the pitch change that, uh, for example, a car horn makes as it goes past you right? Higher as it's coming towards you, lower as it's going away. Actually, you know, you can even demonstrate that in the car with no equipment. When you're driving, just open the window and hear other cars going past you, uh, either parked or, or opposing direction or trees, and you'll hear this shoo, shoo, goes from high shoo, to low. So the same thing happens with spectra. So if we were expecting this triplet to be here and instead we found it shoved over to the right, 
we would know that object was moving away from us. It was a longer wavelength like these due to redshift. On the other hand, if this feature was over here to the left, we'd know the object was coming towards us. That would be blue shift. Let's look at a quick example. I'm not going to talk a lot about supernovae. Uh, there are different types. This type 1A is when there's two stars. <laughs> you know, I, I took this slide off the internet, and the other night I was giving a presentation, and I, I read binary pair, and I thought, wait a second, a binary pair is four stars, right? <laughs> so it's redundant if you say binary pair and there's only two. I think it's a binary system. But when two stars are circling each other, when the giant star, some of its gas ends up on the white dwarf. When you pour gas on something hot, what happens? It blows up. So here is a supernova in M101. Here's a photograph. It's not of this particular one, but it's a type 1A supernova. See that shell? That's the explosion actually occurring. And it's visible for weeks, typically, after a supernova goes off. So David Strange captured this spectrum, as you can see there in the left, with a 9-inch telescope less than 15 minutes of stacked images. So, and there's a little bit of dimming there, but when we plot the intensity graph, it gets very clear. Now, you know, it's an overused expression. People talk a lot about, uh, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and, but we really do. And the giants have figured out that whether it's a binary system or a different type of supernova, like there's some where they run out of fuel and they just core collapse, they collapse on themselves they have different spectral fingerprints. And so now this won't be on the quiz later, but here for a type 1a supernova, notice there's a big dip right here around 6,000. The giants have figured out that that is silicon. Notice that these core collapse supernovae down here, they don't have a big dip there. This type 2 has a huge peak a little higher up, and that's hydrogen. But so this is one of the ways that amateurs can actually do pro-am collaboration. The pros would like us to help identifying supernovae. Uh, and it's easy to do, as you can see here. You know, this is a ding moment too, because I think people think, and I mentioned this earlier, that you need to have a mountaintop observatory and hours worth of integration time. In fact, if you look at some of those showpiece images in the back of the magazines, beautiful nebula, and then you read the fine print and it's 25 hours of, of integration time. <laughs> I live in Seattle, as I mentioned earlier before the meeting. I don't get that many hours in a month sometimes to observe because the skies are cloudy or because the sun sets so late. So I'm glad those people do those beautiful images. But the point I wanted to make is you can do this even without those long images. Now, the, the problem is that supernovae are usually pretty weak and uh, not very bright because they're in other galaxies. But there are supernovae, and they're all published online, that are relatively recent that people would like us to identify. So that's one opportunity we have. Now, uh, what David Strange and I did was we looked at the um, wavelength of that dip. It was 6150 on the scale here. Now, stick with me here. So we measured that wavelength of that uh, ionized silicon at 6150. And then we looked up on Earth if you were to burn silicon. If Benson had burnt beach sand, he would have seen a line at that color, that wavelength. The difference between those is some sort of Doppler shift. I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula, but thankfully uh, Wikipedia had it for me. So we were able to calculate using those two wavelengths, the blue shift from the speed of that shell expanding towards us. There should be several wows there. Wow, that's a big number. Wow, I can't believe that's doable on a backyard telescope. Um, and wow, I'm able to do some of the things that professionals have done. Adam Reese and his team before the turn of the century, they used type 1A supernovae like this as standard candles to study the accelerating cosmological expansion. Now, somehow I don't think they used this piece of equipment to capture their supernovae spectra. But if there was a measure, you know, they talk about, I, don't, I really need a slide for this, but you know, they, uh, they talk about, they talk about signal to noise ratio, you know, and that's just literally, this is a crude way to do it, signal to noise ratio, right? Well, there's another ratio that I thought would be an interesting one to talk about. This is new. I've never presented this like this. Your bang for your buck ratio. 
right? Now we know the buck is only 200 bucks. So the question is, how much bang are we getting compared to the multi-million dollar telescopes that people are using like Adam Reese? I mean, I'm being facetious here, but um, it's, it's fun to think about how much fun you can have. So um, what about the spectrum of a quasar, of a black hole? Well, of course, black holes don't emit light, but that accretion disk, as it spirals in towards that intense gravitational field of the supernova of the, supernova, of the black hole, it, it gets hot and it emits light. So David Strange in Portland, Oregon, just south of here, he captured 3C273. I've never looked at it myself. You can see to the right, the spectrum, right at the tips of those arrows are two little dots. Let's blow them up. There are those little dots. And there's the intensity graph. You can't even see the changes in here visually, but clearly there are some peaks. So this guy was in his mid twenties in 19, I think it was 63, early 1960s. He looked at this and he was trying to figure out what are those peaks? He was really frustrated. So he did what, he said, first of all, I'm gonna go back to square one. Then he did what, what a lot of science is. He decided to start eliminating things that those peaks weren't. And the first thing to eliminate is, let's make sure they aren't the hydrogen lines, hydrogen bomber series. So we brought up a reference chart, and this is that screen from my software I asked you to keep in your mind's eye. And, you know, he looked at the lines. These are the hydrogen lines, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta. It happens to be Vega here, but the reference lines will be the same on any star. That, these are the lines Bunsen discovered. They don't line up with those big peaks, do they? So Martin Schmidt decided, he concluded, well, at least those lines, these big peaks here, I've, I've accomplished something today. They're not hydrogen, but they were enormously redshifted. And he figured it out. So, you know, it's, there's a transcript of him talking about this discovery. It's a fascinating read. Uh, if you can't find it linked on my site, uh, contact me via our contact form. I'll send you the link. He talks about this discovery. He was scared. He was making a mistake because it was such a simple explanation. If he published it, he'd be laughed at by people who recognized his mistake. But the thing is that what he had discovered, that if this had that intense a redshift, and notice that we were able to come very close to the established published figure, this object has to be incredibly bright for us to see it if it is 2 billion light years away, which is what the Hubble constant lets us calculate. It's just a, a division. So it's a very, very bright object. And I know as amateurs sometimes, I mean, we've all sort of seen some of the comparisons to how big things are and how bright things are. This is one of those that is just so uh, astonishing. I thought I'd share it here. For this quasar to be so bright at such a distance, it has to be a hundred times brighter than all of the stars in the Milky Way combined. And one other way to look at it, if this quasar was where Pollux is, you know, the stars are unimaginable distances from us, it would be nearly as bright as the sun. This is a bright object that he was looking at. So he went home that night after he figured it out and ran it past his colleagues who had also been trying to solve this problem. And they agreed that his solution was a reasonable one. He went home that night and he told his wife, he says in this interview, a terrible thing happened at work today. I loved reading that. A terrible thing? Why? Well, he was concerned because he knew that this discovery was big enough that it was going to create in him a celebrity. And he didn't want to be a celebrity. He just wanted to go about his work. To me, the amazing thing is this light that is 2 billion light years old and it's coming a, such a great distance over such a long period of time still has some data in it that we can pluck out with just a small diffraction grating. It's as if that light didn't change. We're able to understand something about that object from so long ago and so far away. It's like the light didn't age, as I said. Now, other things don't age as well. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. <laughs> And I've been justly accused of throwing rocks in a glass house. I mean, look, he's got a full head of hair and I really don't. So, you know, grant me that, you know, <laughs> I'm envious of the guy. Truth be told, and I meant to show you this earlier, truth be told, my wife actually would prefer, and she always tells me to dress for success. And so this is what I came up with. <laughs> Somehow I don't think she, she's... <laughs> 
she's not laughing with me, let me put it that way. So this right here is hydrogen alpha. And, you know, here's the deal. You at home, you and your spouse, you or your spouse, you've come across what I'm just about to say here. I mean, I, I admit it's a mess. It really is. And the other problem is, you know, we're all about color here in spectra. And if you look down there at the bottom, it's no longer that red hydrogen line. It's now getting a little gray down there. And my salon isn't picking up the phone. I can't make an appointment. I just haven't been able to get in. Like I said, I think some of you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So two more quick examples and we'll finish up. One is we've been looking at these hydrogen features, for example, on Vega, hydrogen alpha is right there. If we wanted to zoom in and look at the detail there, I wish it was so easy that we just took our mouse roller wheel and just rolled it in. Wouldn't that be nice? It's not. You know, and we've all done this. We're looking at the moon for the first time with our telescope and we want to zoom in on that crater and see it more clearly so we get a higher mag eyepiece and we keep going up in magnification. Eventually it's empty magnification and the same thing happens if you just zoom in on this with your mouse roller wheel. To study this in detail, you need a slit spectrometer. Then you see something like this. Those are all spectroscopic features of Vega. And like I mentioned in the previous slide, sometimes in science, what we do is we compare a known to an unknown. So let's superimpose on this the spectrum of the moon. And notice that peak is in a different position. Well, the moon isn't really moving towards or away from us, but Vega apparently is. And by measuring that distance, our difference, which is less than an angstrom, we'd never be able to see that detail on this scale. We can estimate the radial velocity of this star, but this does require a slit spectrometer. Okay, this gets hot after a while, forgive me. So last example, and then we'll finish up. I have this little uh, teaching aid here. I keep tripping over this cable. This teaching aid, it's a fast spinning star. This edge is coming towards you. This edge is moving away from you. So this light is blue shifted and this light is red shifted. And there's some light here that from rotation isn't really changing in velocity, so to speak. So here's what Vega looks like. It doesn't rotate very fast. Let's look at the spectrum of a fast rotating star. Again, same thing I mentioned earlier, it's spinning in this direction. So this edge is blue shifted as that light comes towards you. This, light, this edge, the light is uh, red shifted as the light moves away from you. So here's a fast spinning star. See how broadened that is? Because some of the light that's normally here got spread over here. And some of the light that's normally here got spread over there. Altair is a fast rotator. The giants are really smart men and women. The fact that they figured out how to do this kind of thing, which just by looking at light always amazes me. So we've seen a lot of examples. How do you get started? Now I know that uh, as I heard earlier, I didn't know before that the club's got a grading. So a $200 grading that I mentioned earlier, almost any kind of camera, color, mono, whatever. Software, this is my software. Uh, this is that, that shareware that I mentioned earlier that I tried in uh, 2009. I'm friends with the authors. I gave a presentation 10 days ago to the AVSO that they participated in a Zoom presentation. Um, and um, they're, I consider them friends. I've met them in France at, a, at a, a Spectra Star Party, which the cool thing is, I haven't mentioned this in, in years in a talk of mine, but for some reason it came up just now. When we start traveling again, if you, I mean, this is a get out of, again, I'm gonna be gender specific here. Men, husbands, this is a get out of jail free card for you if you take your spouse to France, Southern France, Provence, it's gorgeous. And it works the other way too. It's a beautiful trip. You stay near an observatory. There's amateurs doing spectra, just like any star party, but they're all doing spectra. You can stay in a little town nearby, a walking distance, and eat croissants and drink wine in the town square. It's a wonderful trip. Anyway, we got to finish up here. The last thing you may need is, see this distance here? It's not like focus where it has to be exactly right, but you don't want the grading too close or too far away because you, you don't want the spectrum to spread out too much or not enough. Okay, so there's a little calculator on my site where you plug your telescope specs into and you get some green flags. A lot of people just send me their telescope specs and I do it for them. Um, 
So uh, there's there's great books. Uh, you know, a lot of us did our, a lot of our learning uh, before the turn of the century, and so we remember what it was like to claw your way up the learning curve because there were so few people around to ask questions of. That's no longer the case. Uh, the, there's a lot of good books out there now. This one in particular is cool. It's described on the in the book section on my site, um, and it shows these great images of spectra and what you can expect. If you see two peaks here in the greenish color, then it tells you what they are. For a knuckle dragger like me, that's, that doesn't help. Who cares if there's nitrogen? I don't know what that means. But the cool thing about this book is not only does it have what I'm showing you on the screen there, it's got lots of text that explains what you're seeing. And this is written for us. It's not written for a PhD in astrophysics. So this is a cool book, a great reference book and a great learning tool. So I mentioned earlier online groups, there's huge communities. This is our uh, forum. Lots of people ask great questions and, and people love to answer them. My software is free for 30 days. Four years ago, I gave a uh, in-person workshop to about 100 AAVSO members. They all had sample data I provided in their laptops and we recorded it. It's a YouTube video now. So you can download the software and that sample data and then watch that YouTube video. And you can do that tomorrow, even if you don't even own a telescope. Once you'd spent an hour or two following along, you'd really have spectra in your bones. Uh, and it, it really does change the way, at least for me, the way I read things. It's not only understanding spectra and the other ding moment I wanted to make earlier, which I forgot, uh, and then we'll definitely finish up, is um, when you have the data in your hands, your whole relationship to it changes. You end up being curious about the data, you dig a little bit online, and you start remembering things because it's data that you have in hand. So this kind of learning process is really easy. My site has tons of tutorials that are little two or three minute length videos. Uh, there's it's no big thick manual to read. This isn't very hard. There are opportunities for pro-am collaboration. Uh, these are all amateurs. Uh, and uh, there aren't as many as we'd like. The ABSO is jumping uh, deep into spectroscopy. Uh, their great current executive director, Stella Kafka, as well as her predecessor, Arnie, they're professional astronomers. They know how important spectroscopy is to the field. And so they brought up a database about a year ago. They put a database online where people are contributing spectra, just like people have done with photometry data for years with them. So we've come a long way in the last two or 300 years since Bunsen and, and even before then. We've come a long way in the last 50 or 55 minutes. I'd like to thank everybody for, uh, for uh, staying awake and for laughing at some of my jokes or at least smiling. I don't know whether it was at the jokes or at me. Either way, it's fine. If I get a smile, it means you're, you're freshened up and ready for a little bit more learning. Um, and thank you for organizing this. And especially for those of you who do outreach, I want to thank all of you. It's, of course, as you know, the way we pay it forward as well as paying it backward for the opportunities that we all had and were able to take advantage of, as evidenced by the fact that we're here tonight having discussions like this. Thanks again. There, uh, by the way, is a contact form on the site if you want to contact me that way. Uh, but I appreciate all of you um, coming tonight. Let me stop sharing my screen and we can have a discussion until, uh, until you drag me off the stage. So just unmute yourself if you've got a question. I still want to know, oh, how do you get those numbers? You are right, Evans. And let me share that again. I forgot you would ask that. So there's my program. And what I'm going to do is reset the calibration. And uh, also, I'm going to turn off those blue lines. So what he's pointing out is that this axis here really is in pixels, right? The width of my sensor is 1300. So at pixel, say 150 is the star. That's why this peak is right at 150. We can't use pixels to talk about this scientifically because other people are going to have other size cameras with different numbers of pixels and different amounts of spreading of the spectrum. So we have to convert this x-axis to angstroms, to a common unit, a unit of wavelength. Well, the good news is the star analyzer is a linear dispersion device, which means that it spreads things out relatively uh, in a linear manner. Uh, and so all we need to do is tell the software two known points once. Well, this is one known point. This is the starlight 
that went right through the grating without getting bent. So that's at zero pixels or zero angstroms. So let's tell the software that. At 150, uh, there it is, 155, is, is zero angstroms. We're halfway there to calibrating and we haven't even had to think much. Now this last step is one of those steps that it, it's just a bootstrap we need to know. And that is one, two things. First of all, type A stars have very strong hydrogen bomber features. And secondly, most type A stars have a deep dip just to the left of this peak that's hydrogen beta. So let's put that in. Let's see, that peak is at what, 734. I'm doing it very crudely here. There's other ways to do it. And the hydrogen beta wavelength is just something we need to know is 4861. Now, when I click this apply button, the software is going to take these two, again, just a little, just a brief math thing. Because this is linear, it's the out, simple algebra y equals mx plus b. It's going to solve for that and convert this axis to pixels or angstroms. Now we're calibrated. Now we can hover over any of these points and we can see what their wavelengths are. Now we can do science, and now we can bring up reference lines and see if they match our data. So that's how the calibration works. And the cool thing is, once we've calibrated it once and we have that, which is m in the equation, y equals mx plus b, then we never have to do this process again. All we have to do is tell b, which is the star itself. So that's how we do it, Evans. I, I hope that wasn't too quick. And if I lost some of you, that's okay. There's a great tutorial video on our site for when you uh, get to the point that you need to do this yourselves. Did that answer your question somewhat, Evans? Good, you're muted. Great, other questions anybody have? Yes. Great. We, uh, we do not, we are one of the 300 that start out with the uh, L uh, high reps. Three. Yes. Yes. We do not have reference number one, that star. That's yeah. correct. You don't. Okay. That, now, now, where do we go? Now, really, really good question. So you're looking at something that looks like this. So what you can do is you can superimpose, uh, your, bring it up here first, your neon tube or whatever tube you're using. Just to have a reference tube. And there's actually... Can you um, share your screen? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. That's not the first time I've made that mistake, but it is the soonest that people have told me. Sometimes it takes a while. It's really embarrassing when I do that. <laughs> there we go. So if your spectrum is going to look like this, right? Just because with a high resolution device for people who aren't quite tracking, that means that we're looking at just a little thin slice of the spectrum, not the whole broad spectrum. So what you do, and uh, I want to do um, uh, point it out here. Let me do that. Give me a moment. We'll come over here. Let's see. It doesn't look like there's anything embarrassing here. Um, you can see I'm making sourdough bread during the quarantine. But what I want to show you was on the RSpec video site is a, a whole collection of those videos I mentioned earlier. And this video shows you how to do what you need to do. But basically what you do is you bring up your uh, gas tube reference here first and put it over here. I'll show you another example of that. This will let us discuss one other thing. Let me turn off the playback here. I'm going to bring up a, a reference curve. Let's see, type of uh, uh, Vega is a type A05 star. It's the only star type I know by heart. So now we have two curves. And notice that this professional curve has a dip. It's deeper than mine, but a matching dip there, 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 that's pretty good confirmation that we've got real data. So this could be your, uh, your um, calibration lamps spectrum. And then you go through, uh, and the software has a way to do nonlinear calibration where you can have multiple points. So that's how you would calibrate on yours. I don't have uh, the time uh, or the memory <laughs> to do that uh, without, um, uh, without watching that video once. But that's how you do it. And a lot of people use Alpes or l high reses to calibrate here. Uh, and then if they have really advanced features they need, they may use other software. But quite a few people find that this is sufficient for the kinds of work they're doing. Does that help answer what, what you were asking? Yes. Great. Well, thank you. I wanted to point out one other thing here. Notice that the professional data here keeps climbing. That's like the Planck-like curve, the temperature curve of the star. But notice our data doesn't keep climbing. It starts crashing down to zero. Why would that be? 
Well, our cameras lose sensitivity in the infrared ultraviolet. That's why ours drops. So there is a procedure to correct for that. We just compare ours to theirs and we get a QE curve basically that includes our camera. And once we've done that, then our curve will match this shape. And then we can tell something approximately about the temperature that we're observing. That's not how professionals do it. Professionals use these features to determine star types. But I wanted to show you a cool video to finish up tonight uh, since, uh, since we're on this. And that's Alberio A and B. Let me uh, hit pause here. So here are Alberio A and B in mono because mono is more sensitive and a little better scientifically. And you can see that there's, you know, one's brighter than the other. I can never remember which one is which. Alberio A is the brighter of the two, but we're looking right now at Alberio B. There's that curve corrected for the camera. Uh, and there's a procedure for that in the software for instrument response correction. This is a live video under the, under the sky. We can see that notice there's a lot more, a lot more energy over here in the hot blue region, because this is a, a, a really hot star. Now watch as I move the sampling box up to the brighter of the two stars. This is a type, cribbing to my notes, K star. It's much cooler. And notice that the curve is actually in the opposite slope because it's got the majority of its energy here in the cooler red rather than the hotter blue. So this is the kind of thing that I wanted to do 11 years ago when I uh, was uh, looking into spectroscopy. Now, for those of you who do outreach, I, if you're like me, you may prefer to do uh, daytime outreach. I do. I'd rather see the people I'm talking with and, and get a good night's sleep and not be cold. So um, there are spectra uh, devices, and uh, some of you may be familiar with them. Uh, you're mentioning the El Jairez reminds me of this. This is a device made by the same company. It's called an El Jairez light, and uh, this isn't a particularly good view. There we go. It's, uh, it, you don't even need to track with it. Uh, it's got a gnomon to point approximately at the sun, and it's by Shaliak. It's called El Jairez light. And again, because we're just looking at a tiny piece of the spectrum, you have to tune it for which color region you want to look at. And right now, it's tuned towards this magnesium. And let's, the this, there it is, tuned towards magnesium. And this is an embarrassingly bad video. This is my cell phone made in our front yard for a friend in Canada who wanted to see what it could do. And there you can see a triplet. So that's the magnesium triplet. Why does magnesium have three lines right next to each other? That's way above my pay scale. It has something to do with quantum mechanics, and I, I just don't know. So, and then you can tune this thing with that lever. Let me just go quickly here. There is, in blue, there's the hydrogen, hydrogen alpha right there, and so forth. And one other one we show, there's the sodium doublet. So if you set this up next to your solar telescope, like a LUNT or a PST, then especially if you've got a crowd and somebody to work both telescopes, two people at least, you have something to distract people and also something again that you can transition into talking a little bit about the science. I think you'll be surprised uh, in, in areas that are, are, are relatively affluent uh, and so they have good education that how much people will know about this phenomena, mostly from the third or fourth episode of Cosmos where Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, talks about spectroscopy. By the way, that poster of ours I showed of the uh, periodic table of spectra, he told me he has one hanging on his wall. So I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, and there's a big story about that that we just don't have time to tell tonight. Anyway, what else? Yeah, uh, Tom, I had a question. This is Julie. Great. Um, like if you're looking at hydrogen and bomber lines, or, or sometimes you're looking at a source and you're trying to figure out what's in there, and yeah. different mm -hmm. elements have a different number of lines, you always have to be able to see all the lines to confirm what you're seeing? Like, well, that's a good question. Um, in fact, on my spectrum, it was only like four of the eight bomber lines that we could see. The, the uh, other lines were uh, into the ultraviolet and blue. So the devil's in the details, really, in terms of how do we identify things? Yeah, and that's why I have trouble. Yeah, you won't necessarily see all the lines because some of the lines may be hidden uh, because they're 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 too too narrow for a low resolution device like this to see. Um, and so typically what most of us as amateurs do is we know what we're looking for. 
you know, we use a book like this and the, my site has a lot of examples and things that you can look for. And so in that case, you know, you know, look, there's, I can see it's right at a, what's a wave like 65, 62. That's my hydrogen alpha. And so you more or less know what you're looking for. Even when you're looking at some new object, you have an idea what it is that you expect to see. So you don't have to see, it's a great question, Julie. You don't have to see all the lines. Right. Sometimes you'll just see one or two depending on the object you're looking at. Yeah, and I find that I turn on the elements a lot to find yeah. out how close I am and where I'm at. And right now, uh, I got a little frustrated, so I haven't turned the program on in a little while because we have a neon lamp. Yes. I think in our, in our, on our non slit, on our slit spectrum. Uh huh. And I was, I'm trying to do the uh, nonlinear cow. Yeah. And I have a problem with, you know, you see all these gazillion lines there in right. the neon and trying to pinpoint which one's which and so on and so forth. So I it guess. Is, there are a lot of lines in neon. And that's why I didn't want to try demoing it because it really is a forest of lines that you try and narrow down. Uh, it takes a little bit of trial and error to sort of get familiar with which lines are going to be most prominent that I can align with. Uh, and the good news is, uh, unless you tune your uh, spectrometer differently or screw the grading in a little differently, then once you've, done, once you've done that once, sorry for the noise, you never need to do it again until you change the setup. And, and I notice I have your 100 great of my own. I have your program at home. Yeah. And I'm taking some pictures of that where I like where you see the star and it's, you know, two point count and everything. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, I look at the uh, angst, Pixum's angstles, and then when we do one on the, the clubs, it's like yeah. fractions of, so I can see where the accuracy is. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the clubs is probably going to be more accurate. How big a telescope do you have at the club, by the way? We have a 16, but we normally do it on the 12. Yeah, that's much more reasonable. And there's tons of stuff to look at. You lose, as, as you probably noticed, uh, when you put a grating in, in the light path, you lose about five magnitudes. Yes. Because you're spreading the photons out across lots of pixels. Oh, I forgot to turn my camera on. So how, you know, I, I need these, these, oh, now I've really messed up. My camera's dead right now. So um, uh, when you spread the photons out across hundreds of pixels, you lose sensitivity. Right. Um, and so you just image dimmer, uh, not as dim a star. Right. Anyway, other questions? Now that I'm this anonymous disembodied voice that can't show myself. Hi, Peter. What's up? Tom? Yeah, hi, Tom. Thanks for your uh, presentation. How, how deep can we go with a 12 or a 16-inch telescope? Um, it just magnitude. depends on what your, da what your normal limiting magnitude is, and then just subtract five or six from it. So it really just depends on so many factors on how dark your skies are, you know, whether you're stacking, how sensitive your camera is. That's why the rule of thumb is so easy for me to, to slip the hook on that question. And that is, uh, you can't even see me winking for God's sake. This really stinks. Uh, and that is, it's just, and there was a wink there, believe me. Uh, it's just a matter of five or six magnitudes less dim than what you can do uh, normally. So that'll just give you an idea as to what you can expect. Now on the L high res light, uh, it may be different than that even. Uh, it may, you may lose even more because you're spreading the light out even more. Gee, this really stinks. I'm really disappointed I can't get my webcam to work here. Anyway, other questions? Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Geddes? Yeah, hi Tom. Um, hi. I don't know if you remember me, but um, you and I spoke when uh, we first got our spectrograph in your software. Um, I was your original point of contact about a year and a half ago. Okay. So um, the neon reference source, um, I, I, when we got the spectrograph, I ordered a, a boatload of those neons to have so that just in case they became obsolete or not available, we, we'd have tons of them. Yeah. But it, it is a complicated spectra that they emit and I'm wondering, if there is not a better element that we could use with that spectrograph to use as a reference. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, that would be something to ask on our forum where there's more people doing, uh, doing slit spectroscopy with more experience with what's in the market. I'm just not familiar with all those things. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, and and then I guess the next question, uh, which we'll have to look into, is um, it, you know the, whatever we end up choosing, it may not be a one for one replacement into the spectrograph because obviously uh, there's a voltage being applied to that neon uh, bulb to get it to uh, ionize and things like that. So we'll have to be careful of yeah. of what we pick. So. I know that there's a there's a tube that people talk about. It's a Relco uh, fluorescent uh, starter uh, element of some sort. I don't know much about it. Some sort of starter tube for fluorescent lights. But definitely, you could even drop a line to Shelliac and ask them what other uh, gas tubes they have. There's, I know sometimes people use uh, neon or argon or, or other elements. So that's just something to ask. And feel free to drop me a line as you explore that if I have any suggestions as you're going down that path, I'd, I'd be happy to share them with you. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. We, uh, we definitely will. It's just like, as noted, it's, uh, it's a very, very complicated spectrum. And I was wondering why in the world, other than neon being so common, you know, neon bulbs are a dime a dozen. And so it's uh, kind of easy to, to pick that, but there's tons of other bulbs available and I'm, I'm just kind of wondering why they settled on neon but oh well i think it's because there are so many lines so no matter where you are in the spectrum you have something of interest i'm just uh, guessing i mean i don't know here what i want to show you since i have it uh, now this is what i wanted to show you earlier this is my live field of view there i am i'm a diva so I, you know i want to make sure you see me there uh and this is a gas this is a gas tube of the sort that we're discussing uh, I waved this in front of you earlier. Uh, you know, you can see it's, um, now that I can actually see it on my screen, you can actually see it's, it's helium. Uh, here's my hydrogen gas tube. That was the one I wanted to show you. And you apply a high voltage to it. And the camera that I'm using is, uh, is this is a camera like this. It's got a grating built into it. And now you can see uh, there's our hydrogen alpha, beta and robin egg blue, and gamma. So what we're talking about is having a tube like this in the spectrometer to help with calibrating. That's, that's what uh, we're discussing. This is pretty cool to see. But the other thing to show you, since you mentioned neon, uh, let's see if I can quickly show you here. Instead of that gas tube device, they make this carousel. And this carousel, there's, a, oh, let's put up a dark background. Uh, this this carousel there's there's argon you can see there's a a lot of a lot of lines in there in argon but the cool thing about this is you can just you know there's nitrogen look at how many look at that spectrum uh, and there's neon that's what he's talking about it, it you, you almost can't see the individual lines at this low resolution but of course in uh, in your L high res light you can see a variety of lines but this is a cool device uh, you know, there's, and there's helium. Helium is, is, is sort of a sweet spot where you see a lot of lines, but not too many. Anyway, this is what I wanted to show you earlier, and I'm happy to show it to you. I think this is helpful for people to see that this is real, this stuff. Uh, these gas tubes can be left on for days without dying, as opposed to the other one I showed you earlier, where these die within about 20 minutes. So, yeah. um, um, along the same lines, just a quick uh, additional question. Uh, have you ever heard of anyone using lasers, since they're monochromatic, uh, uh, to use as a reference source? The problem is there aren't, um, there, um, there aren't enough lines in the laser world to do a good calibration across uh, a, wide, uh, a wide range of wavelengths. So, oh, but, but I meant as far as uh, a, a reference point. If, I, I, I haven't, but I don't know why. I think probably the, the challenge is you know, getting a laser pointer inside the device, and, you know, how you do all that. And also lasers typically are pretty broad in, in the uh, uh, light that they're emitting. Well, yeah, well, see, I mean, you can get lab grade, um, you know, spectrophysics and stuff, um, uh, lasers available that, that are pretty pure and are monochromatic and, I can't imagine it'd be too difficult to, to get it to point, you know, into the spectrograph. And I just thought it might make for a good single reference point. I think it, it could, but again, I'd encourage you 
our, our uh, forum here, you know, this is Ken Harrison who wrote one of the, one of the pre, in fact, he's the designer of, uh, uh, what was the replacement for the El High Res light? I can't remember what it was, but Ken Harrison designed a knockoff of it years ago. He knows his stuff and there's other people around on our site who are really much better qualified than I am to answer those kinds of questions. I think they're probably good questions uh, and that you'll find satisfactory answers there. Okay. Anything else? Well, listen, I'm gonna take off, uh, get some dinner and uh, let you all gossip behind my back, throw me under the bus. Let me know if I can ever help you. Uh, I'm always happy to help. Thanks again, and especially thanks. Thanks, Phil. Thanks uh, to all of you who do outreach. And Peter, have a All right, well, that's it for our meeting, but we usually some of us stick around in here. So if you got to head out, that's fine. And if you want to hang out, that's cool too. I, I had a question for him. I'm, I'm not sure if he could have answered it. it was on the issue of camera focus on the spectra that we keep going back to whenever we're messing with our spectrograph. Uh, I put a link to that forum he was talking about in the chat. It's a groups IO page too. So if you have an account, you can, uh, I think just uh, click on join this group on their page and you should be able to ask them all questions. Okay. Or I'm sure if you wanted to email him directly, he could get back with you. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have to leave. I'm running out of, of power. I'm just on battery. So it's been fun. Good night, group. Good night. Bye. Bye, Dick. Bye, Dick. Anyone have observing reports? A gorgeous, gorgeous thin crescent moon. Uh, in the southwest. Well, I might talk a little bit about, I rediscovered my 10-inch daub. I hadn't used it in years because I do so much outreach and I don't use the daub for that. So, so I dug it out and, and uh, got the spider webs out of it uh, and uh, cleaned the mirror. And I had forgotten, and I haven't probably looked at a planet in it in six or seven years. And uh, since we have three of them sitting out there right now, uh, pointed the daub at the planets, and uh, I had forgotten how good the contrast is in that uh, Newtonian. Uh, so then I took another step uh, and uh, purchased the uh, uh, Telview Delight eyepiece and the Batter uh, uh, Contrast Booster uh, filter. Uh, and then uh, Mars in particular, uh, being at the altitude that it's at right now, uh, even when the seeing isn't great, I was just stunned at what you could see on the, what I could see on Mars. There were a couple nights that that uh, Delight bar load was about 280 power. It was crisp and it was sharp, uh, just uh, stunning. But I think the problem is that we've been looking at Jupiter and Saturn so low uh, for so many years that we've forgotten what a difference it makes when we get one of those planets a little higher in altitude. So. Uh, kind of got me excited about uh, looking at the planets again. Unfortunately, I'm not excited about the cold weather. Uh, and uh, we've had some uh, pretty cool nights, but uh, have very much enjoyed uh, looking at Mars. The next time it's around, it's going to be about the size it is now. Uh, and then uh, two years after that, it starts getting pretty small. It was 22.6 arc seconds across at opposition. Uh, I think it's 17 arc seconds, next opposition, then we're dropping down to 14 and 13. So some of us old codgers had better take a look at it. We're not sure if we're going to get a look again. Yeah, as of yesterday, it was, Mars was 17 arc seconds. Yeah. Well, Friday, Friday night was one of the clearest nights I've ever been. I didn't have a telescope out, but I went out around midnight and Orion's getting pretty high now. I, I could not believe the detail I could see just visually with my eyes on Orion there. Uh, I mean, the, the constellation and stuff. So there's been some good nights, but now the weather's getting so freaking cold with that 20 mile an hour wind all the time that uh, uh, maybe, maybe that wind will let up here. It's supposed to warm up this weekend. Probably rain though, so you won't be able to take advantage of it. 
Mars has been excellent. Uh, I've been looking at it through uh, my my five inch refractor, and uh, the the last few nights uh, uh, that I was out before this spat of bad weather, really really steady uh, skies, which is really a surprise for this area. We have so much interference from uh, jet stream that uh, it uh, it's a real struggle. And Jupiter does degrade real quickly, uh, so you get out there right after dark and uh, make sure you get your viewing in before it gets any lower. That has yeah. been a real struggle, but. A lot of great red spot transits if uh, if you can get out there soon enough. So it's been fun. I have to admit the uh, the Orion Nebula is one of my favorite objects at uh, at high power. And if you have a, a decent sky uh, at high power, you know you can see some of the really small stars sort of peeking out from their uh, their nebular uh, 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 blanket, and uh, it really, it's a really interesting effect. So it's about time to get the uh, 18 out in the backyard and, and take a look and see how it looks. It's one of my favorite winter sites. So lots of thermals and, uh, and thick gloves, but I, I think we'll get it to work out. So Joe, have you ever seen it under really dark skies? Yeah, I, I have. That. Down in, uh, in Kentucky, uh, at the Western Kentucky Star Party, they have a, they usually have a, a really transparent uh, a sky and uh, uh, it's really dark. There's very little around it, so the, there's really no light dome. So it's a, it's a really spectacular view. You have to stay up till about three in the morning because uh, that star party was always on at uh, uh, the end of September. So you had to wait a long time for Orion to get up high enough to make it, uh, to make it visible. Yeah, out, out in New Mexico at uh, Gila Wilderness, some of the darkest skies in the United States, and it was just almost twice the size that you see around here. Little fingers of nebulosity and little dark tendrils. It's just a fascinating object if you can get to a dark sky. Yeah, that would be that would be spectacular. I can't remember the, uh, the first time I saw it through uh, any telescope, but uh, it's, it certainly is memorable once you, you get it under decent conditions like that, good optics. I, I can remember the first time I saw it about 50 years ago with my homemade 10 inch in a plywood tube. And it was the only object I could find other than the planets. <laughs> and, uh, got me kind of excited about astronomy, but then I couldn't find anything else with that system. so. <laughs> yeah, it's great fun. Mine was with a 3.1 inch Unitron, I think, that I drug home from uh, junior high. The junior high uh, science teacher saw that I had an interest in astronomy in eighth grade, and he let me actually borrow this thing in the wooden case and uh, I, I didn't have buses or anything, so I, I, I lived one mile from school, so here I was dragging this Unitron wooden case and with the, had the tripod and telescope and everything, and of course it was January up in Michigan, so I'm, what an experience, but I never forget setting it up late at night and got a view of the planets, and um, M42, of course, was one of the objects and uh, one I'll never ever forget, but that was, that was the first time I saw it and it uh, just was uh, jaw dropping. You, you know, once this COVID thing is over and we can go back to our star parties, if there are some of you that have never participated in those star parties, you get to help other people have that experience. Uh, and especially when we do the, like the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, uh, it's just some little kid will look through that telescope and go, oh my goodness, awesome. Uh, and uh, pretty rewarding uh, being able to uh, introduce, being part of that first experience of saying, yeah, you're seeing that with your eyes, that's real. You know what, Mark, you're, you're absolutely right because um, my very, very first object that when I set it up was Saturn. That was the first yeah. time I ever looked through a telescope and I had no idea what I was doing. I was just by myself. 
uh, you know, here I am, my eighth grader, setting up this scope for the first time. And, and somehow or another, I, I found Saturn and was able to focus it. And when I finally looked at it, it just did something to me, you know, that view, it, you know, I still remember it and it stuck with me all these years. And that's why I have an interest, you know, in astronomy the way I do. So you're absolutely right. Being able to, to share a moment like that with, with a youngster would be, would be very, very cool. Yeah, I just did that with a guy that's 52 years old and he wants to buy a telescope. So I set three of mine up, a cat, the 10 inch dub, uh, and a four inch uh, a refractor. Uh, and had him look through all three. And when he looked at Saturn, it was, that can't be real. And uh, it was, yeah, that is real. <laughs> and, and now he's, unfortunately, now is the worst time to buy a telescope because nobody had heaven. They're all sold out, basically. Uh, but he's really excited. He wants a 12-inch dub. And so uh, I got to experience that with a 52-year-old last Friday. That's very, very cool. Does he live around here? Yeah, he lives just a little north of me. And he, oh, may we'll have, he may have already joined the society. I told him to get on the, the website to join the society. So. Okay. Good. Mark, do you Boy. remember uh, that time that we had with uh, the Boy Scouts when they Yeah, were, I'll never forget that. And, uh, yeah. They, uh, there were, must have been 100 tents set up out uh, all around on the field there. And Mark has his scope set up. We had uh, indicated to the uh, scouting group, though, that we were not going to have star parties. But uh, but Mark had set his scope up, and so I walked over to uh, a tent near. Uh, I was near the shed, and uh, uh, there were, uh, I think, four boys in the tent. And I said, would you like to look through a telescope? They were busy looking at manuals and things. And he said, well, no. And I said, have you ever seen Saturn through a telescope? <laughs> he looked at me and I said, there it is now. And he bailed out of the tent, ran over to the telescope and every one of them, wow, 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 wow. Yep. <laughs> Every single one said that yeah. word. Wow. It, uh, a thrill to see the, the uh, uh, it's uh, one of the reasons we do what we do. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Kurt and I just learned his niece wants to be an astronaut when she grows up. So I'm trying to think of good Christmas presents for her space presents. <laughs> mm. We learned that this year, so we haven't really been able to take her to the observatory or see her. The Apollo 11 uh, video from last, uh, last year? Last, yeah, last year. That'd be good. What was that? The Apollo 11 video. Mm. The documentary about going to the moon, you know, NASA's, oh, NASA's uh, oh, the uh, film that they yeah. put together. That was that excellent. Was incredible. <laughs> Wasn't that the one you hosted uh, at uh, Indiana Tech, Sarah? Um, that was the PBS, doc there was a PBS document, docu-series that came out. Um, what was that called again? I can't remember. It was uh, the year uh, of astronomy. It was being featured uh, on PBS. Uh, <laughs> uh, I remember it because uh, uh, we got our advertisement and I had to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> you remember things like that, right? <laughs> it's going to get your wallet. It does. <laughs> you know, I think that it's on Disney Plus, and I'm not sure because we stream on a number of different, but I think it's Disney Plus. It has like a, uh, a an eight a series of eight uh, I think they're one hour programs. The title is the same as the movie, The Right Stuff. 
and it's a kind of remake of the movie of the original Apollo 7, or the uh, original Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, and uh, I suspect, and I haven't watched it yet, but I suspect something like that uh, they would find very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, those early days, it was pretty crude. Uh, if they thought they had to abort, they manually had a switch that they had to reach out and pull down to abort and, and uh, hopefully escape. Pretty crude back in those days. Did you hear about the monkey? The first, the first astronaut that was a monkey, Ham? It was like when they set up the mercury capsules, they needed to uh, test it, so they trained this monkey. Mm -hmm. And if he did the right stuff, like this banana pellet would come out, you know? <laughs> so something went wrong, and it was doing this, like, suborbital flight, and it started shocking the monkey. <laughs> and the monkey just was like a hero. He, his, his name was Ham, and he went to the National Zoo after that. But he basically pressed all the right buttons and said, screw the banana pellet and... Uh, you know, like some of the early astronauts were kind of comparing themselves to a monkey and they were kind of embarrassed by, you know, like did the he monkey come, did it before people did it, you know. Did he come before or after the Russian dog? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to look it up. It was kind of close. Yeah, the, the Russians put their dog in space and just let it die. They, it orbited <laughs> died in space. That was really... Not nice. Because the source and eats the book. It was a dog day for the dog. <laughs> the log architect. Like <laughs> so I don't know if any of you watched the uh, four astronauts that went up to the uh, uh, International Space Station. I watched the launch on the NASA channel, and then I watched the docking last night at about eleven o'clock. Oh, so those astronauts didn't have to do anything. They sat there and watched. They had these nice screens, but uh, they didn't have to do anything. It was all computer, all automated, the docking and the whole thing. They but just sat back and watched. Like a Tesla on auto autopilot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while they crash. Uh, friends of mine live in Fort Myers. Uh, they actually said they could see that launch the other day. <laughs> Which well, I had I, relatives down there that put pictures. I've seen pictures of the launch from uh, where my relatives live. They could wow. see it. Yeah. But I, I was surprised Fort Myers went 200 mile or so anyway yeah. away from there, and they saw it. So uh, you're going down there when? Uh, me, I don't go down till the middle of January. Okay, just checking. Uh, right now, I wish I was down there, but it's cold as it is. But <laughs> it's middle of January. Do you have your uh, solar observing pen nearby? Oh no, I have the uh, I have the certificate nearby, but not the pen. Oh okay, I wanted to see that bad boy. Oh the pen, well I could should be on the lapel. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm afraid it's not. I can go find it though. It'll take me a minute, but I'll be back. Well, I'll go find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to step out. Uh, good night, everybody. Night, Mark. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mark. So, Jim, did you ever find the hell attack? Or not the hell attack? What, um, yes, the, I found the hyperstar. I found the hyperstar. Awesome. Yeah. How can you lose a telescope, man? I didn't lose a telescope. It's a lens. And I moved and I had several totes of stuff. And it was in a tote about one foot behind me where I stand at my workbench that's crowded in the garage. So I just had to dig through the stuff. But, you know. You're talking about, you're talking about just the replacement diagonal for that scope, right? Yeah, it's like a lens. You unscrew the center part and then you pop this thing in and screw it in and, you know. So we'll have to set something up and, like, do that because that sounds kind of cool. You know, well, yeah, we've been waiting. <laughs> uh, Joe's got his uh, certificate there, but I only got a thumbnail on it, though. Wow, share the 
Fact is, the pin looks a whole lot like the, uh, the middle of the uh, certificate. So here's the pin. Oh, nice. One way or the other. There we go. There. Like an enamel one? Yes. Cool. Wow. Yeah, it was nice. I really uh, was surprised. Club went all out to, uh, so thank you, Phil. <laughs> And uh, Julie, I think, left. But uh, thanks again. It was really special. Appreciate that. <clears throat> I'm about two thirds of the way through the, the lunar pro the program, but given the fact it takes a month to, to get around to each of the days again, if you miss something, it's it's going to take a couple of more months to get through it. Yeah. So thanks. Sure.